Hello everybody, my name is James. Welcome to King's Fine Woodworking. Today I want to show you how to build a cigar humidor. This one is made from Pacific Coast Tiger Maple. On the inside it is lined completely with Spanish cedar in order to hold the humidity for the cigars and on the top I have an inlay that's made from East Indian Rosewood. So to start the project off here, I have a block of East Indian Rosewood that originally came as a turning blank. I am going to cut some 1 8 inch thick pieces of wood from this and I'm actually going to send it over to a friend who's going to do the inlay work for me. He's going to do the milling on his CNC machine and I don't really know how many of these blanks that he'll need so I'll cut a few uh, in case he needs to practice on one or two before the final cut. Now I don't want these warping because they are pretty thin pieces of wood so I'm going to create a little makeshift sticker system here and sticker these together and hold them together in order to send them over to his place. And I think that will probably do it. So now they're over at my buddy's house. His name is Brian Benham. And he is also on YouTube. He is a fantastic woodworker. And you guys definitely should go and check out his channel. The CNC inlay work that he did for me turned out beautiful. But that's not really even his specialty. He does all sorts of woodworking and all of his projects are beautiful. Um, I'm going to leave a link to his channel in the description for you guys to go and check it out. While we are watching Brian work here, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to everybody who has helped to support our channel. For those of you who use our Amazon links to purchase the tools and supplies that you need for your woodworking and other things, I want to say a big thank you. All of that really goes a long way in helping us support our channel. And I need to say a very big thank you to everybody who supports us on Patreon. Without you, it wouldn't be possible to do all the things that we do. Thank you very much. And if any of you are interested in helping to support our YouTube channel, I have links in the description as to how you can do that. You could certainly build a humidor without putting an inlay or a logo on the top. This one was done for a client and it matched a corporate logo. So I had mentioned earlier that I cut three pieces of wood for him to accomplish this with, but even though you can see it's pretty delicate, he managed to do the whole thing with one piece perfectly. So the process was essentially the same for the lid. I actually made the, the piece that was going to be the lid quite a bit oversized so that there was plenty of room to work. And it's essentially the negative or the, the reverse of what the logo is going to be. And that takes care of the logo with the inlay work. You guys should go and check out Brian's page and see some of the other stuff that he builds. Back in my shop, I am dealing with this uh, Pacific Coast Tiger Maple here. And the boards that I had came pretty warped. Um, they had some twist, some warp, some bow. Uh, they weren't very straight on any of the edges, so the first thing I kind of need to do is, and you may, this may occur to you if you have wood sitting around that's in bad shape, the first thing really is to achieve some sort of a straight edge on one side. This edge may not end up being square with the piece, but just get it straight on one side, that way you can safely rip it against your table saw uh, fence. And I'm ripping this piece wider than it needs to be, uh, because I've got a lot more milling that I need to do. After that, I'm going to go ahead and cross cut it down to approximate size. 
Here again, I'm still making it bigger than I need it by about an inch or so. Now, since it had some twist in it and it is approximately the right size, I'm going to take it back over to the jointer and I'm going to face joint or surface one side. After doing that, I like to take a pencil and mark the side that is not flat, which is the side up top, the side that I'll need to be uh, putting underneath my planer so that the planer can cut that down to parallel. And I'll proceed through and do all of my pieces this way before taking them to the planer. At the planer, I know that my blades are on the top side of the machine, so I'm going to feed them into the planer with the pencil mark up. That way the top of the machine, the cutter head there, will cut the top side down so that it's perfectly parallel with the bottom side. So now that I have lumber that's been milled to the point where it's flat and parallel, the two main faces, now I can go back to my jointer and this will actually be squaring one edge. I wasn't really squaring it before because my faces weren't flat. Now this is the official squaring of one edge. When that's done, I will go back to the table saw and this time I will be cutting the remainder of the piece off to get it down to the exact size I need and this action is cutting it so that it is now parallel from side to side. And that's the final milling operation that's needed for these boards. Finally, I will cross cut the pieces to the exact length needed. And a lot of people ask me why I am doing this on a cross cut sled as opposed to my chop saw. And the reason is pretty simple. Even the very best of chop saws is not very accurate when it comes to cross cutting. They can easily be off. Um, by a couple of hundredths of an inch or, or even even much worse than that sometimes as much as a 32nd or even a 16th of an inch over some distance when they're cutting however if you build a crosscut sled in something like this and I do have a video on how to make one uh, these things can be very very accurate my crosscut sled is within one or two thousandths of an inch accuracy over the whole length of the cut and that really helps when you're building a box to keep it perfectly square which brings us to our next step. The first thing we like to do is to set up our box in the orientation that we want to see it in. We'll pick and choose the faces of wood that we like to be out, and then we'll kind of lay all of the pieces out in exploded fashion and write which boards that we choose to be the tail boards and which boards we choose to be the pin boards. And then we'll set up our dovetail jig and begin to cut out our dovetails. So we don't really have the time in this video for me to go very in depth and show you precisely how to make through dovetails, but I do have a video that is dedicated to making through dovetails and it shows you every single step from start to finish so that even someone with no experience can make a perfect dovetail on their first try. And I will put a link to that video in the description. So the tails are the most decorative part of the dovetail joint and we've chosen to have the tail boards be the front and back of the box. The two sides of the box are the pin boards and we're cutting the pin boards now. What we're doing here to ensure a perfect fit is once all of the joints have been cut we run back over it one more time with the router to make sure that we didn't accidentally miss anything. And it just makes our pieces fit together much nicer. If you have never cut dovetails before, it's definitely something worth giving a try. It's a whole lot of fun and it makes for a very beautiful joint. And if you use something like this Porter Cable Jig, it doesn't take very much effort at all to get an absolute perfect joint. I will have links in the description below of all of the tools, the specialty tools and hardware and supplies that I used while building this job in case you have any interest.
Once all of the pieces are cut, it is customary to do a dry fit to make sure that all of your joints fit together nicely before beginning a glue up. And this is one of the nice things about using a good dovetail jig. Uh, typically, if you've done things right, done your setup right, your boards will fit together on your first attempt and you won't have any adjustment to do. And although it's often advisable to use scrap wood first to create a mock-up of your joint to make sure that your settings are correct, uh, the truth is, is after you've done dovetails for a little while on a dovetail jig, you typically just skip that part altogether and your first cut is actually in your final piece that you're going to use. For a project like a humidor, which is going to get some humidity, um, even though I, we're actually going to take a lot of precaution and try to seal uh, the humidity away from the maple, um, just the same humidity is going to be involved. And so I would use a, a glue like Tight Bond 3, which is the most water resistant of the glues that they have available. For me, that works out nicely because the only glue that I use in my shop, or the only PVA glue that I use in my shop, is Tight Bond 3. Uh, we buy that in bulk, we always have for years. Uh, just recently, actually, um, Tight Bond sponsored us and sent us a barrel, a giant 55 gallon drum of Type Bond 3. So it doesn't look like we're ever going to run out of that. Um, but if you're out there uh, trying to decide what glue to use, uh, Type Bond 3 would be a good choice because it's the most water resistant. And I also like to make sure that I get glue on uh, both sides of every joint. Uh, that way you get a very strong bond and you don't actually have any glue starved areas. So it is very important to clamp these joints together once you have glued them and assembled them, but you do want to take some care and don't overclamp. If you overclamp, you can cause the boards to bow inward towards one another, and that bow will still be there after the glue has dried and you remove the clamps. And that'll be very obvious on the box that you're building, and it'll be very hard to deal with when it comes to creating the lid and everything else. And I typically let joints like this cure overnight before taking them out of the clamps. Once the box is out of clamps, there's quite a bit of work to do. We typically like to see the dovetails and pins extrude a little bit beyond the point of the wall of the box. This way we can sand those down. And the best way to do that I have found is to just get aggressive. I use 36 grit paper on a belt sander and take everything down to flush. You could do it with a random orbit, you could do it with a lesser grit, but why spend a half an hour or an hour sanding when you can get it done in just a minute or two? When that's done, I switch to 60 grit in my random orbit sander and get everything with that, and then I gradually progress down all the way to about 220 grit. And if you start aggressive and work your way down, it actually goes really fast. And you can tell what was once some pretty ugly looking dovetail joints now look pretty nice. And while I'm doing the sanding, my daughter Maya is over cutting components for the lid. One of the designs that I like for a lid is something that looks like a modified raised panel door. So we have rails and styles and then a floating raised panel on the inside. And I think it looks really attractive for a box, especially something like this. So the parts she's cutting out now would be what would be considered the rails and styles. We also like to take the time to cut one or two extra while we are in the process of making these so that they're all the same. This way if we mess one up, we can just grab one of our extra pieces and continue the project. The next step would be to cross cut them to length on the miter saw. For this step, I like to leave them about one inch long. Yeah, 
And that's it. We'll put them together and set them aside for the next step. Once I have the outsides of the box sanded down nicely all the way around, I need to turn my attention to the top and the bottom. It's very important to have these perfectly flat, and the best way to do that is to create a big sanding block like I've done here. It's four sheets of sandpaper, spray adhesive attached to a flat piece of particle board. Now I want to cut the rabbit in order for me to recess the bottom panel of the box. So I have a rabbiting bit set up in my router table and I've raised it up so I'm cutting about a quarter of an inch height at one shot. I'm going to raise it so I cut a total of almost a half, but I don't really want to do that in one pass. It cuts a lot better and it's a little bit safer if I can do it in two passes. So that's what I'm going to do. This could also be done by hand with a handheld router. It is just a little bit easier on a router table, so if you have one, that might be the way to go. With the rabbiting done, we can take an accurate measure of the inside opening here and go ahead and cut the bottom of our box. I'm just going to use the chop saw to cut a piece off of this long board that I have here and get something smaller that I can work with on the table saw. The chop saw is nice for rough cuts, but it's not accurate enough for what I need for the bottom of this box. The board that I purchased was skip planed to about 13 16 of an inch, so I need to plane it down to get it to the thickness that I need, which is around a half inch. So I've cut it to the exact width needed for the bottom. The next step would be to cross cut it to the exact length. And for that, I have to use my cross cut sled. It's the most accurate tool that I have in the shop. Finally, I have two choices. One, I could have squared those rabbit cuts, or two, I can just simply set my board in place and trace the round curvature that's left in them from the router bit, and then sand the board itself to fit the curves, and that's the option I'm going to choose. This is actually a pretty easy task. You can do this with a random orbit sander or a belt sander. You could even do it by hand. Uh, the trick is just sand it down exactly to the pencil line. Take it over to your box for a test fit. And if it doesn't quite fit, just sand a little bit more. Uh, a couple of uh, tries back and forth and you'll get a perfect fit. As always, it's advisable to get a dry fit before you glue it up. And speaking of glue, my favorite part of working in the shop, uh, the good people at Tight Bond have decided to send me a 55 gallon drum of glue. I couldn't be happier, so we're going to have lots and lots of this stuff to last. Oh, that's not off. What did you do? Oh, I went too far. But as you can see, we're going to have to learn how to use that glue valve. And once again, in case you're wondering, yes, this is exactly the right amount of glue to use for this glue up. One thing many might be wondering is the glue up that we're doing here in a cross grain situation and expansion and contraction. We don't have to worry about expansion and contraction in this point because the board I'm using is actually fairly thin and it will never have the power to overcome the strength of those through dovetails. Finally, we'll clamp it down securely, uh, let that dry overnight, and then we'll proceed to the next step. You can see the glue squeeze out on the bottom of the box, and that will be easy to sand off. One thing we didn't show on camera is that we took the time to clean it out from the inside of the box before it dried. Now we're going to jump back over to those rails and styles that are going to be components of the raised panel lid that we're going to attach uh, to the box here. When you buy a router bit kit that is a rail and style bit, 
Uh, the bit that we're using here is the one that's designed for the styles, the vertical cutting portion. Some people call it a cope and stick cutting method, and this would be the part that cuts the stick, not the cope. And we have chosen not to use coping as a method of joining it, since it's going to be on top of a box. I think mitering the ends of these will look better. This is the Incra Miter 5000 sled, which is a really good sled. It's, it's great for a lot of things that you might, might want to cut that are angles other than 45 degrees. Uh, for 45 degrees, if you just build a, a, a cross-cut sled with a, a miter capability, it's really just as accurate. But for anything other than 45, this is really the, the type of jig to have. Uh, Inker makes a lot of good stuff. And I'm using the stop function there, which I drop down in place after my first cut. This allows me to have repeatability so that I can make the two ends exactly the same length. It's important that the front and back portions of the top are exactly the same and the two side portions are exactly the same. If they're not, the miters won't be tight. And here's kind of a little test fit of what it's going to look like. It's designed so that we're going to have a raised panel portion in the middle. And when I cut these rail and style components out, I have cut them in such a way that they're just slightly longer and slightly wider than the box, maybe by a sixteenth of an inch, so that I can sand them down to becoming perfectly flush with the box once everything's installed. And now it's time for me to go ahead and make that raised panel portion. I'm going back to the lid component here that my friend Brian uh, put the inlay on for me. The only difference is when I got it back from his shop, I gave it several coats of lacquer so that it didn't get scuffed up in my shop in the meantime while it was waiting to be put into the box. And I did have him cut it oversized. That way I could cut it down to the exact dimensions I wanted when I was ready to use it. And the only reason I have the blue tape on there is because it holds the pencil line a little bit better so that I can kind of see the cuts that I'm doing. Now it's at my router table where I'm going to cut out the profile with my raised panel bit. I do have a pretty big three and a quarter horsepower router so I can make pretty big raised panel cuts with just one pass. But there's no problem with doing this with a smaller router. You just might need to take a couple of passes, or maybe even three if your router's small. Uh, but it'll work just fine for you. So after having cut that out, that's kind of a preview of what the top is going to look like. But the sides are still too thick to fit in the box, or in the slots in the rails and styles. So I'm going to put my rabbiting bit back on and size those down just a little bit so that they fit inside of those rail and style components. And of course every time I get something done or cut I've got to go and do a quick dry fit and see what it looks like. And I like that look a lot, so I'm pretty happy here. Next we'll need to sand this raised panel a bit. And I like to use these foam blocks to do it with. I'll put a link to those in the description. And there really is nothing better than this 3M flexible sandpaper. This stuff lasts forever. So for the glue up, I like to put one drop of glue right in the middle of the panel. Not really necessary, the panel could float completely. Uh, but I do want to coat all of the miter, mitered ends very well in glue. And I like to coat uh, both ends of every joint to ensure that there is no glue starved areas. And that's especially important in end grain where a lot of the glue will actually wick up deeper into the end grain. That's actually one of the things that makes an end grain glue up so weak is that the glue gets absorbed up into the end grain before it has a chance to cure and there's simply less glue in the joint. 
So you might notice that I had the clamps completely set up for me and pre-adjusted to make this clamp go as easy as possible. When gluing together mitered corners like this, you have to take your time and tighten and loosen back and forth, kind of uh, jockeying with it until you get the miter joint glued exactly right. We're going to let that glue up overnight and I'm going to cut the video in half right about here. And I hope you come back and see the second half of the video. Thanks for watching.